Welcome to the Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers and its monthly author showcase. I am your host, Peter Stockwell. Author David Martin has agreed to join our show this month at the Bremerton Kitsap Access Television Studios. He lives in the Grease Harbor area, but we still accept him around here in Kitsap. We met through various signing events, and he has been a regular participant at these CLAW events over this last year. Welcome to our broadcast for the Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Well, we're going to dive right into this. Tell us about your background. Well, probably unusual background. I spent my whole career in the maritime industry and uh, started off to be a ship's officer and didn't work out with the end of the Vietnam War. So I went, I joined the Coast Guard and eventually ended up uh, in the marine industry ashore with the Military Sealift Command, which is a, a civilian branch of the Navy. Fantastic. And so you had how many years in the Coast Guard? Well, I had, uh, with, I, I, I retired with a regular and reserve of 21 years Coast Guard and another 25 years of the Navy beyond that. So you've had, you really did ship out. Uh, I, I yeah. know ships. So you've lived in this area for how long? In the uh, Olympic Peninsula? Uh, I guess uh, going on three years. Three years. And where were you before that? I spent 34 years before that in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. Oh, you lucky dog. You, you escaped. <laughs> I escaped. Yeah, I had a daughter who lived back in Virginia in the Fredericksburg area, and they're out here now having just escaped. They've only been here since June. So what led you to becoming a writer in the first place? You know, I wish I had a, a good answer to that. I did a little bit of writing and in high school, and uh, I wrote one uh, short story uh, in college, and uh, uh, not, and then it was just a bunch of technical writing. But after I retired, it was um, going through periods of uh, of uh, bad sleep. I would get up and read, and then I found solace reading the Psalms. So I started writing Psalms, and one Easter about three years ago, I decided uh, to write a short story. And that that came about to your historical events. That now, you have written, in terms of history, you have written biblical history, mm -hmm. and you have also written, um, is it English history, that your latest book? Right. It's, it's the Thirty Years' War. Yeah. Very good. So tell us about them. Tell, us, tell these viewers out here in this world of ours about what you write. Well, I started writing, as you mentioned, uh, I, I started writing psalms, and then it, read in, it, it, it came to a story, which was my first biblical story, which is right here, this book, which is The Praise Singer. And uh, uh, he's called The Praise Singer because he writes, he sings psalms. Uh, and it's uh, tied in some very obscure things. The, uh, this obscure man, Melchizedek, priest of the Most High God, who uh, is very very uh, sh um, poorly defined in the Old Testament, but interpreted in the New Testament. So I took with him, and I added with him the, the whole concept of uh, someone looking for God in general revelation, just saying, seeing if there is a God. And I put that story together, and that's uh, the praise singer. And Melchizedek, of course, is one of the ancient... Um, he was a king with priest. Right, he was he, a priest. Um, he was priest of the Most High God, King of Salem. So he yeah. was a priest and king, a uh, man with no genealogy. And uh, so, in, in Hebrews four, Paul spends well most of the book of Hebrews saying how Jesus was a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Yeah. So tell us about your research, because research for these stories has to be rather intense. Research is, I enjoy research because uh, I enjoyed getting back not only in, into, in, into, the, into the Bible, but also into the culture and the history, what else was happening, what other writings were, were, were there about the era. So I looked about the technology of the times, the other history of the times, uh, about uh, Canaan and the fact that Egypt, the great power, was in the midst of a civil war. So Canaan was kind of left to itself and uh, all these strange things happened. And what sources other than the Bible did you use? Uh, I, you, you find research in all, you, you, of course you start on the web, there's so many ways, and then you start, you find something that's history, and you start pulling a thread and digging deeper and, uh, and reading and finding out more. And it, it just leads, it leads to more questions and more ideas and saying, you know, that, I've got to write about that. 
So I, so I write about where, uh, you know, the, the, the tin trade and the uh, copper trade and uh, the way bricks were made and the way the, the, new, right, the new way of building temples in, in Egypt, all those things that, uh, that kind of caught my curiosity and make our way into the story. And the rest of us, of course, we're after the story, but those bits of information about what life was like during that time period lends itself to entertainment. Right, it's entertaining and it's, it's, it's realized, it puts it in, it's not just uh, a cold story. There were real people in real times uh, uh, suffering a lot of the same issues that we have today. There's a technology revolution between weapons. There's, just as we continue today, the chariot out and, uh, and the early use of the horse was first as a chariot and they never thought of riding horses until hundreds of years later. So you learn things in, in that. So I, I, I wrote that story as, uh, as a backdrop of, um, of kind of a, of, of a faith journey that was of typical of, of, uh, of, of a lot of people today. And I followed that story up with the story of, um, if, if that was a story that, that had, uh, was based upon, you know, the theory and, and the ideas of, 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 of atonement and God and God mm -hmm. speaking, I wanted to write a, a, an actual, take a case study. And that was my second book, which is uh, yep. The Oak of Weeping. And that's about Naomi and Ruth. Well, it's about, uh, it's, it's, it's the story of um, Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, and their uh, uh, servant Deborah, oh, and oh, Deborah, yeah, okay. And uh, so I, I say that's kind of the case study of of the first book, and they kind of contemporary. And I made I tied the two books together with a lot of the the characters I oh. had. I I made uh, the daughter of my hero in the first book, Deborah, who becomes the servant to Rebecca in the second book. I was able to carry on with the next generation, and show how how they lived what. Uh, they were learning from Melchizedek in the first book. Okay. Now, your third book about the Thirty Years' War, mm -hmm. uh, a wonderful time period where we're Protestants and uh, Roman Catholics are fighting each other for control of England. Well, the th yeah, the, I, I chose that because, well, first of all, I wanted to write a, a series of a book because um, it gets hard when you have to lose your characters as they die <laughs> off. So I decided I wanted to write a series and have a, a, a character, a hero. And I wanted to do it different. I wanted to do it as a mystery series. So oh. every bit is historical, but I love the idea of, of, of mystery in a, in, in a period piece. And the lessons are, you know, uh, less direct, but still applicable. And I chose the Thirty Years' War as a time period because it was the perfect storm when uh, politics, religion, corruption, and greed came together in the bloodiest war that Europe has ever seen. Um, and uh, I wanted to, to show that there were good and bad on both sides, and there are lessons to be yeah. learned. So what did you do for research in the, the Thirty Years' War? Ah, uh, well, the one thing about the Thirty Years' War, again, I, I found some excellent, excellent uh, English histories. Uh, I wrote it from an English perspective because of King James, uh, and uh, his his uh, daughter was the uh, uh, Countess Elizabeth of, of the Palatine. Mm -hmm. uh, her husband actually was the cause of the start of the war, and he tried to play both sides as, as the politician. So the English have 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 written a lot of good history on it, but I wanted to make the story come up to life. So I do that through the characters, and I threw that through a, I just contrived a plot. And like all mysteries, it's mysteries within a mystery. You're a mystery writer, you know I, that. I understand you're, the idea of mysteries within the mysteries. And, uh, which makes it a lot more you've fun. Got, it's got, a lot harder to write, but a lot you've more You've got fun. your main storyline, but you've also got these sidelines that at the end will come together, and yeah. a, at some point they will all tie together. Okay. Marketing. That's a challenge for all of us. And um, we get out there and market, market, market as best we can. What do you do to get your books and your name out into this world to this handful of readers that we have that we're trying to make into a bigger group? Well, I've come to Kitsap Access Television. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah we welcome thing. you here. That's good. This is uh, one way we do it. And, you know, and that, it's, it, it is, it's tough. You're, you're, you're absolutely right, and that's why I joined CLAW, and I appreciate uh, all the, the, the help that uh, 
the other members of CLAW ha have given me. And, uh, uh, but I found, uh, you know, I'm out there with Facebook. I have a website, uh, and I'm, I'm out there um, letting my friends and the world know as best I can what's available and just waiting for that good that good review or good interview the right person to pick it up for it to really take off but in the meantime most of my marketing is uh, at events in the area and kids okay. here in Bremerton and Kitsap County uh, and word of mouth and word of mouth where I you sell uh, well we, well we you, you, you sell the books one by one and uh, make a much greater percentage than you do on Amazon well, that's true because uh, your profit margin is a bit higher when you're marketing your own books out there in the world as opposed to uh, having them go out through the uh, sales offices of libraries and bookstores and such and through Amazon, of course. Yeah, it was funny because I was looking at my uh, list of books on Amazon the other day and my uh, 1495 and uh, 1695 books are out there. They're whopping 495. Really? How is anybody making any profit on that? But I've already been paid, so I'm not going to worry about it. Gig Harbor, and that's where you are from, that right. area. Yep, love it. And, of course, they have a very vibrant arts community down there because we were, uh, I went down for one of our author friends mm -hmm. at the film festival that uh, was in Gig Harbor, and um, one of her shorts is being, was being shown down there. And um, are you involved with any of the groups that abound in the area? Yeah, I am with. Uh, I am a member of the Peninsula Art League in okay. Gig Harbor, and uh, uh, although because uh, they they do have uh, they they do consider writers authors as artists, so they let us in. But uh, and I do participate in their uh, in their annual um, arts walk in uh, every summer. Yeah, and that's the one that Larry Fowler was right. setting up and yep. got me involved in this last year, and I'll probably do it again. Uh, Larry is another one of our great authors of histories writings especially about um, Abraham Lincoln and he has a couple of really good books out there all right so we now know what you do down in Gig Harbor when you're working with these uh, various groups and what are you writing now well um, I, I know you've got a book coming out pretty soon right I have a book that's gonna do it should pop on Amazon and you have we'll we'll place this up a little bit but uh, this is the cover for his next book and um, I'll make sure that gets into the uh, uh, show so that people can actually see what it is. Tell us about it. Okay, that, the, it's, um, it's the third book. I've, I actually, I've, my, uh, my publisher has, has divided. I have, I have two series. Mm -hmm. And the one is called the Hall of Faith series, which is my biblical uh, fiction. And this one's biblical. This one's biblical. It's the, early, it's, it's the name of it is the Epistle, the Story of the Early Church. And it ties, it goes back to, to uh, the New Testament interpretation of who Melchizedek really was. So it ties the books together. And it starts, uh, it begins with, um, with, with uh, the temple being shaken and the curtain in the Holy of Holies being torn while Christ is on the cross being crucified. And it ends with the destruction of the temple. So in that 40-year time period, yeah. it was a time of tumult and upheaval and persecution in a time when people had to choose sides and, and make some pretty tough decisions. And the church was learning. There was no scripture. So it was, uh, it was an exciting time. Well, and there's much that hasn't been written. Uh, I, I follow, in the beginning, I follow a little bit the story, the book of Acts, which adds the history. But I go to people that aren't really talked about often, like Mark and the, and the church in Egypt, and not only in Alexandria, but up to Nile, up into, uh, into Cush. And I talk about uh, Priscilla and Aquila, and I, and, I, and I talk about some of the others, um, and I talk about really the struggle for the priest. My, my, my primary character is, is a temple priest, and he becomes a believer. Now, what does a temple priest do now that he's been, his sins have been t atoned for? Yeah. And how does he live with the idea that his rabbinical duties are now changed? Exactly. And how does he learn wh what, what is the new meaning? What's yeah. now expected of him? So it, it, it's, it's a good story. And I try very, very hard. Um, my concept is, uh, is, to, is, to, is to give the reader the experience. 
So I try very hard to to make these people as real as 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 can be, and to, and to show that the struggles that they're dealing with are are not too far from our own. Yeah. Do you see expanding your genre to other areas rather than history books? Yeah, um, I do. I'm, I'm as I I am. F currently about a, a quarter of the way through the follow-on to my second mystery in the, in the same series. But my, uh, my publisher, which is uh, Blue Forge Press in, uh, um, Down in Port Orchard, in Port Orchard right. she, she really wants me to continue writing the biblical but I, but I'll, but, and, and the others, but I have some other things. And so I'm finishing that story, but I am also writing uh, short stories now for anthologies and uh, and that's the Blue Forge anthologies that yes, they put out. Yes, Blue Forge I uh, I was asked to write one for uh, for Unnerved which is or Unnerved 2 which is mm -hmm. comes out in Halloween which is uh, uh, basically not horror but I was asked to to do something edgy or unnerving about you know from f you know from a bible story but I also write I've also written a, a short story for one on uh, uh, I said, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to do something about love. So I, I suggested we do something on sacrificial love. And I did a short story called The Courtship. Very good. And tell us about that. Well, again, it's, uh, it's, it's sacrificial love. And uh, maybe when we get some time, I'll, I'll read a, uh, a, a, a section of it. But it, it's, I, I took, again, I took a story. It's a it's a biblical story and uh, on sacrificial love and tried to make it come alive. It's it's the story of the, it. You'll recognize the readers will recognize it. It's the story of the woman at the well. Oh yes, they would, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. And of course, I was going to ask you the question of who publishes your books, but Blue Forge down in Port Orchard with uh, Jennifer and um, Brianna DeMarco. Right. Has uh, they also work on other authors that are in our area, and. Um, I'm glad you have, a, of course, I publish my own work, but I'm glad that you have a publisher you're happy with. Well, let me say a few words. I, I, I actually, I, I, I really have tremendous uh, uh, respect for the, the amazing DeMarcos, yes. as I'll call them. And uh, in addition to their, their press, they, they do uh, gaming, they do videos, and now they're doing recordings. Um, and they look, they're a nonprofit. And they look for uh, authors uh, whose works are would get a tough t have a tough time getting published in the uh, in the very competitive uh, wide market that you, you'd find in New York. So a tremendous tremendous opportunity for uh, artists in this area. Well, many of us writers set a time during the day in which we do our writing, and. That means that any aspiring author that you might know out there, or one that will meet us uh, by watching this show, could learn from your routine. What does a typical day look like for you? Well, I, yeah, it's... Do you write every day? I try to write every day, but I don't let it impact my family life. So there are days that, you know, if I've got a busy schedule with my wife or my grandkids, I just put it aside. Uh, and uh, there are certain times of the day that I won't write. I will not write after dinner when I have time just sitting with my wife, you know, and the prime time television, whether, whether we're sitting beside each other talking or whatever, I'm going to be sitting next to her. I'm not going to be writing. But so I like to write during today, during, during the mornings. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if I really get uh, um, going, I'll, I'll, I'll do some other. My goal for writing is simply this. I write scene by scene. Okay. So when I sit down, I want to be able to complete a scene. I may not know where the next scene is going to go, but I want to get that scene. And the scene is typically several pages. Okay, so that brings up the question, are you a pantser or a plotter? I'm, I'm a hybrid. I plot my books in advance. I write my character sketches in advance. Mm -hmm. But I don't feel compelled to stick to my outline. I have an outline, I know where it's going, but the, the story will take itself in different directions. Well, and dead down characters come out and talk to you, don't they? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. <laughs> and the fun part, of course, is, uh, you know, especially when you're writing a mystery, is just maintaining suspense. Yeah. And one of the best things you can do in maintain suspense, of course, is cut to the other story, a subplot, <laughs> and leave things hanging. Yes, at the end forth. of each chapter, you just leave that little hook that says, 
Well, what are you talking about here? He says, well, you're, you're going to have to come back in about two or three chapters, and I'll let you know. Exactly. Yeah. And um, that's a lot of, I, I, when I do it, and I read to my wife, cause, and I don't know whether you read your stories and your writings, your manuscripts to your wife, but I will read them to my wife, Sandy, uh, chapter by chapter. And then she tells, eh, that's no, eh. Or she'll say, ooh, this one's really good. And so I listen to her because she reads a lot of books. And um, she's a big, big, very big help. Okay. So you're the hybrid. Right. And you have a regular time that you try to do it. I try to write in, in, in the morning, right after I get up. And I try to write, and I try to get that first scene down. And then what happens, and if I can't write, I research. Okay. It's as simple as that, because there's always more research to be done. Because yeah. there's, in the back of your mind, well, did they have banks in 1620? Because that's where I just had that question. And Actually, they did. Uh, 1609, before, yeah. Bank of Amsterdam. <laughs> yes. And, you know, yes, you have to learn those yes, things. they did. You have to ask, you, especially for any historical novels, because people will, will, will challenge and, you. And the funny things. thing was, not, not too long after that, they started check writing. Yes, and that's all. all yeah, it's all that historical stuff. Yeah. So, so what I, but I find, I, I, after I write or get, get stuck, I like to take a shower. And then it's in my shower when all those, okay, this is how this is going to come together. Oh, that's, that's. <laughs> so not only are you cleansing your body, you're cleansing your soul for a new write. Yeah, I'm, yes, that's, that's right. That's good, that's good. Well, if a book club or other organization wanted to have you come speak to them, mm -hmm. how do we get a hold of you? Well, the best way is I have a website which uh, has all of my books and my projects, and it's davidjmartin.com. And look, it just went over the top of your head. Ah, very good. Yeah. So do you have other projects that you're working on besides the fact you've got a new book, The Epistle, coming out? Right. And what is that coming out? Any day now. Any in day? De here in December. It'll, it should be out. Okay. It should be on Amazon, and two weeks after Amazon has it, I will have it, and and sell, I, I sell on my, I, I push my website rather than Amazon because I will guarantee you an autographed copy in true, the mail. True, true, true. So, what are you writing on now? I, I'm writing, as I said, I'm writing on the, the follow-up, book two. Uh, it's it's going to be called Soldiers of the King. It picks up where this one left off. And it, again, it was the, the plot, the primer, well... Are we getting towards the end of the Thirty Years' War, or right in no, the middle of it? No, we're or? still in the very, very beginning of the beginning it. Beginning of it. But okay. I, in my research, I came up with one of the most unbelievable scenarios. I didn't think it was true, but it was true. So obviously, I had to write about that. So that'll be. Do the you want to give us a little um, hint about this particular? Well, you remember Dick Cheney? Remember, go back to him and his in his uh, misdeeds w with a hunting rifle. Oh, yes, when he shot his friend. Well, in true story, the Archbishop of Canterbury took out, killed a game warden on a hunt with, 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 with a crossbow in uh, 1621. Those game wardens shouldn't look like elk. And, and he was, he was uh, stripped of his office and put on trial because the idea, it was a, clearly an accident, but uh, is... is can a priest continue in his vocation if he's guilty of a homicide? And then finally, the king asked it. So I, I chose that story, but I spiced it up a little bit, as well as another <laughs> continuing plot. Well, that's good. And I look forward to that one, too, because, and my wife would, because she does like English history. Uh, she's read all about the uh, War of the Roses, the, you know, between the Plantagenets and the Tudors and everybody else that got involved, the Thirty Years' War and the battles that uh, took place, um, and all of this over religion. Mm -hmm. What a crazy thing. It is crazy. And so you've, you've written your histories about biblical times and even before biblical times because, I mean, the Bible's not really as old as people think it is. It didn't exist until... Well, the Moses wrote most of the Old Testament. Yeah. And, or at least uh, the, the first five books, the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch. And yeah. the rest of the Bible, yes, it's... it's it, so. it, I mean, we've got the histories and such, and um, all of that in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the New Testament was put together as people started writing about right. Jesus Christ. But it never got really all put together until Nicaea. Right. And um, so... 
Whether people want to believe it or not, we've not had the Bible forever. That's correct. That's correct. And we don't have any perfectly pure, clean, original editions. You said something about reading from one of your um, texts, one of your books. So I see you have brought something about the epistle. Would yeah. you like to read? Sure. I'll, I'll give you, a, I'll, I'm going to read, I'll read the opening chapter uh, of the epistle and you get a feel for my writing. I like uh, descriptive openings, but, uh, uh, and, and develop the characters later on. Okay. Now what we're going to do here, and I'll cut this out. This is where I cut you in reading, and we'll have you read separately. Okay. Okay. All right. This is from the, uh, my, the book that's coming out shortly, the epistle. The great stones beneath him began to groan. Their painful lament, like giant teeth grinding in despair, growing stronger as the afternoon darkness deepened. A wind came up, circling and twisting, looking for a direction to follow, whistling the tune to the stones. The groaning blocks of limestone began to shake, rhythmically at first, swaying side to side, each sway greater than the last. Ezra was thrown violently down onto the dancing hard rock floor as he heard crashing stone upon stone and metal upon rock and the eerie screams of others reminding him that he was not alone until at last the great stone blocks gave one long shudder before coming to rest. Ezra looked at the massive doors of the temple before him, thrown wide open like outstretched wings of an angel in mourning, their lower outer corners resting on the now still stone floor. Their lower pintles were bent, grasping with tiny fingers, holding secure the mass of the great doors, freshly adorned in King Herod's gold. The upper pintles had sheared and lost their grip. Ezra's sight was drawn inside, and he saw the golden menorah candles stand lying in the middle of the floor. The showbread was scattered about in the ashes and the embers of the golden altar of incense lying forlorn on its side. Ezra lay prone before the holy court looking through to the holy of holies. A new sound, a tearing, drew his eyes to the enormous blue curtain at the far end of the temple. Do my eyes deceive me, he thought as two ghostly hands appeared at the top center of the curtain, grasping and renting. His ears confirmed what his eyes were seeing. The curtain was being ripped, torn apart from top to bottom. The massive curtain beam was broken, and there before his eyes, for all to see, was an empty room with only a foundation from Solomon's temple where once lay the glorious gold-covered Ark of the Covenant with its carved, gilded cherubim, wingtip to wingtip protecting the ark from above. Ezra stared at the destruction before him, and he wept. He heard only the gentle bleeding of a lamb who escaped a sacrifice. The young priest slowly stood up and turned around. Behind him, other priests, worshipers, and many pilgrims and sacrificial animals were also finding their feet. Some dazed and frightened and some hurrying to avoid rivers of embers and ash still crawling along the stone floor where the altar fire spilled from above. The high altar was still intact, but the ramp from the court of the priests lay in ruin with stone and earth fill covering the milky white limestone floor. Priests caught in the act of sacrificing at the altar stood and stared, their way down, destroyed. Then the rain came. It quenched the fire and gathered the ash. Rivulets became rivers, and the mud, ash, and coal swept across the court of the priests through the gates into the court of the women and the court of the Gentiles. The rain continued, and the whole temple mount bled, spilling over the walls and down into the lower city in the Kidron Valley. Ezra walked slowly out of the court of the priests into the court of the Gentiles. He walked all the way to the north end of the court and looked out past the fortress of Antonia towards the Damascus Road, and there, at a place called Golgotha, through flashes of lightning, he could see three men hanging on Roman crosses of crucifixion. Memories returned of the man Jesus, one of the three now hanging in agony and humiliation. Only days ago, Ezra listened as Jesus taught at the temple. Ezra was sitting with the scribes, listening. The words of Jesus were still full of strength and authority though the man himself was not assuming an ordinary. His voice was soft and his tone gentle. But there was something else. 
something behind the voice and the words spoken, a verity, truth, yet a mystery. As appealing a teacher Jesus was, in the end, Ezra could not quite understand his, mes his message. As recalled being spellbound by this simple Galilean with an incredible mind and how the spell was broken when Caiaphas, the temple high priest, challenged Jesus, saying, By what authority do you teach? Jesus responded with a question of his own. The baptism of John, was it of heaven or men? Caiaphas turned to the scribes beside him for an answer. They argued among them. If we say of heaven, Jesus will say, then why did you not listen to him? And if we say of man, the people will be angry because they believe John to be a prophet. Caiaphas' face flushed with anger, and he turned to Jesus and said, We do not know. Jesus calmly replied, Then neither shall I say by what authority I teach. As I remembered the reports that he heard of Jesus' trial before the council last night, it was all that his fellow priests could talk about that day. He heard of the witness who reminded the council that Jesus had said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. There were many witnesses against Jesus, but their stories did not agree. Finally, Caiaphas took matters into his own hands, and in violation of the law, he badgered Jesus with the question of his guilt. Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus had been silent before his accusers. He had not uttered a single word during his trial. But now he turned and looked straight into Caiaphas' angry eyes and firmly said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. All those there said that the council was silent. The Sanhedrin was stunned by Jesus' words. Then Caiaphas violently tore his robe and shouted, What need of further witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What is your decision? All the witnesses confirmed that the council agreed Jesus was worthy of death. Caiaphas spent the night dragging Jesus first to Pilate, then to Herod, and finally back to Pilate. Caiaphas arranged for a crowd to shout and insist Jesus be crucified by the Roman procur procurator. Reluctantly, Pilate agreed and handed Jesus over to his guards to be beaten and taken out of the city and crucified. Friends told Ezra that Caiaphas and his father-in-law Annas were so determined to see Jesus dead that they followed him as he carried his cross out of the fortress through the streets and to the crucifixion site, Golgotha. Staring at the man on the center cross, Ezra wondered, why does Caiaphas fear Jesus? Where does such hatred come from? I suppose he is out there in the storm waiting for him to die. What will he make of what has happened here? Did I really see the hand of God tearing at the curtain? Was it my imagination, my fascination with the story of Daniel? Seen or unseen, I believe God is speaking to us. Why does God shake the foundation of his own temple? Thank you, David, for sharing all you do in this literary world with us and sharing part of your story with us and coming out to record this show. And I do look forward to following your endeavors in the peninsula and having you join us again for other events that CLAW is going to be sponsoring over the course of the year. Uh, we do share a common interest in this writing in our retirement. I think it's, it's a lot of fun. And as part of the literary artists and writers, I do invite you to come to those events. Um, and as we continue working together, you may find that there's somebody that you want to feature and that you will sit on this side and interview them. And we've had that uh, done. Um, I would like to thank also all of our viewers for tuning in to the Bremerton Kitsap Access Television and viewing this Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers production. I also wish to thank the BCAT staff on cameras and in the director's chair. Our broadcasts are scheduled for Saturday evenings at 6 p.m on Wave Cable Channel 3 and Comcast Channel 12. You can also view a live stream on the BCAT website at bkat.org at that 6% Pacific Standard Time. CLAW presents is repeated on Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m. And keep in touch with our social and media and author web pages to discover where you can meet these local authors and artists. In the past, many authors have attended several events across the West Sound region, 
this year, and CLAW will again sponsor signings throughout 2020. So stay tuned so that you can meet our wealth of vibrant and popular writers of fiction and nonfiction books. I hope everyone has a pleasant evening and a productive and fascinating week. And until next Saturday, I am Peter Stockwell with the Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers. In conjunction with the Bremerton Kitsap Access Television, good night. <laughs>